For quite a while now, we've been watching SpaceX do some very impressive things, especially when it comes to landing boosters. The Falcon Heavy, I think, is probably the most impressive example of how boosters have been landed and reused by SpaceX for other purposes. When I first saw the Falcon Heavy take off, the most powerful rocket on the face of the planet, and it remains so, I was very impressed, incredibly excited, elated in fact, and yet my elation didn't even begin to compare to when I saw this happen. I mean, it was a virtuoso feat of mathematics and engineering the likes of which the world had never seen before and may never see again, at least in terms of a first-time basis. I was utterly stunned. Even people who didn't care about rockets were impressed with this. And it's this kind of purely powered landing that SpaceX has proven itself to be so damn good at. From the SN5 landing that we saw not very long ago, and that was a hell of a moment, as I'm sure all of you will agree. And it's this very same method that SpaceX plans to use when they set the lunar starship down on the moon's surface. Powered landing with plenty of propellant, or at least enough to make sure that you can have a soft landing on the surface without having to rely on anything except the power of the vessel itself. But this isn't how we're going to be handling Mars, or at least according to the current plan, not at all. Instead, as most of us know, the Starship is going to hit the atmosphere like a skydiver using every bit of the Martian atmosphere to decelerate, going from hypersonic speeds down to subsonic speeds, and you'll remain at subsonic for three precious minutes while preparing to use the last of your propellant for this particular maneuver. And of course, most of you have seen this many times before as well, but nevertheless, it doesn't look any less dangerous every time I watch it. But here we go, a powered landing essentially for the last 0.1% of the landing. Now, is this really doable? Well, theoretically, yes, but nevertheless, I would like to see SpaceX actually carry out what they do best, a powered landing on the surface of Mars, much as they've been doing for most of their existence. Why can't this be done on Mars? What makes it so damn impossible, and are there options? Well, we're going to find out right now. Good evening, and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So, no sooner did I release a couple of videos commemorating 12,000 subscribers than I hit 13,000 subscribers, and even way beyond that at this point. I, I don't know what to say. This channel is catching fire, and it's all because of you folks, and thank you. Thank you so very much. I, I just don't know what to say. You're making my dreams come true, my dreams of making this a career, and that's about all I know what to say besides that. Thank you for making this a reality. So all I'm going to do in return is just keep trying to provide you with the best possible content that I can. So the Starship Suicide Dive, this is something I've been talking about for a while now, and it may seem like I've gone back and forth on it a bit. When I first rolled it out, I talked about it as if it was, you know, a manageable and potentially safe form of landing the Starship. It's the current plan, after all. And simulations and current physics seem to indicate that it could be done. 
What concerns me about it is, is that it doesn't conform to what SpaceX is so good at, which is powered landings. I mean, that's what we've seen SN5 do with their hops so far. That's what we've seen the Falcon 9s do. That's what we've seen the Falcon Heavy do. Everything is involved with a powered landing, not using the atmosphere for 99.9% .9 of your landing process, and then a, la a last second pull up with whatever fuel that you have remaining. To me, this seems to be an unnecessarily risky approach. And I think, honestly, that the folks at SpaceX probably feel the same way. And since we're so far away from that right now that we still have to get the Starship even into orbit and we have to work on the Super Heavy before we do anything about the landing process, I'm pretty certain that they're working on this process over there as well, trying to find ways of making it safer. Because whereas I think that we could probably use it for cargo, it'd be a lot more difficult to realistically look at this as a process that's going to be consistently safe for people. I think that it's going to be a long, hard road for us to get this process there. And so that's why I like talking about alternatives. Not to say that this can't work, but I would like to look at alternatives. And this time I'm going to be talking about fuel depots, both at the starting point, when the Starship leaves, um, in this case, it would be lunar orbit when it fuels up there. And also at the receiving end, we would have a fuel depot waiting with the objective of giving the Starship a full tank of fuel before attempting landing, thus giving it the possibility of a powered landing through a great deal of the procedure. Because SpaceX is so good at powered landings, I'd like to see if there's a way, and I'm pretty certain that engineers over there are doing the same, see if there's a way that this can be done. And so I'm going to talk about propellant depots, the challenges that face them, and the way that we might be able to make this work. So get ready for another episode of the Starship Suicide Dive and ways that we might be able to make it safer. The one factor that makes a powered landing on Mars so damn difficult is this gravity that we happen to be saddled with. Everybody talks about how perfect the Earth is in so many respects. Well, in terms of getting off of this rock, it's actually very, very difficult compared to a number of other planets in the solar system. It requires 85% of a rocket's mass to be fueled just to get to low Earth orbit, 90% to get to geostationary orbit, 95% to get to the Moon, and over 98% to get to Mars, at least within a reasonable time frame. It's absolutely insane. So this is why the Starship requires so many refuelings in low Earth orbit, six at minimum in order to reach Mars within a reasonable time frame, because it requires so much of the tanker's fuel just to get to low Earth orbit and to return safely that all it's doing is transferring a hundred tons worth of fuel, basically it's cargo, that's all it can manage. So even though the Starship can carry 1,200 tons worth of propellant, six refuelings are only going to give it 600 tons, which is barely enough to get to Mars within five to six months, to decelerate a little bit, albeit not very much, and arrive at Mars with almost nothing left. Propellant boil-off makes the problem even worse. For a good portion of its journey, the Starship is going to be exposed at least partially to the sun's heat, and so therefore a portion of whatever fuel it has remaining is going to boil off into space. Methalox fuel is a little better as far as this is concerned, but still without an active refrigeration unit, which tends to be pretty heavy, there's no way around this problem. 
So, by the time the Starship is going to arrive at Mars, you're going to be very, very lucky to have enough fuel left to carry out the last second pull-up maneuver that's going to be required with the Starship suicide dive. But even though it's a complex solution, here's how you eliminate most of that problem entirely. First of all, you place a propellant depot in either low Earth orbit or preferably in lunar orbit where it's a lot easier to get your manufactured fuel on the moon to the depot. You fill the depot up with as much fuel as you need and top off the Starship's fuel tanks with a full 1200 plus tons worth of fuel. Since the Starship will have all that extra fuel, it will be able to decelerate sufficiently to rendezvous with another fuel depot in Martian orbit and top off its fuel tanks again to a full 1200 tons, thus allowing it to re-enter the Martian atmosphere using the atmosphere for part of the deceleration, but then a whole lot of fuel in order to execute a powered landing once again is SpaceX's specialty. Now there's a private company called Shackleton Energy that's planning to design and build fuel depots. This one happens to be designed by <coughs> Boeing. Oh, sorry, just about threw up there. Um, but in any event, the principle is very sound. The fuel tanks use a combination of multiple layers of insulation on top of an active refrigeration unit in every tank, supplied by a solar power source. And this system has already been tested on Earth in a vacuum situation that simulates deep space. Tests conducted at NASA's Supplemental Multi-Layer Insulation Research Facility, or SMURF for short, demonstrated that a tank insulated with 34 layers plus a condenser plus a cryocooler was able to achieve zero boil-off on liquid hydrogen, which has a much higher boil-off rate than methalox fuel, which the Starship uses. There have been many other tests carried out since then. However, these tests and the technology itself have been strongly resisted by certain individuals in political positions whose positions would be threatened, or rather their project, namely the SLS, would be threatened by something like this, because after all, the SLS does not make any use of this particular kind of technology. And by the way, in case you're interested, here's the ringleader, the chief ass himself, state senator from Alabama, Richard Shelby, who reportedly said that if he hears one more word about propellant depots, he's going to cancel the space technology program. What a jerk. But his motivations are obvious. The SLS is based on the antiquated notion that you need a rocket that's going to burn up almost all of its fuel in order to get anywhere in the solar system. And since it has to do this, it has to be expendable by nature. If you put propellant depots in orbit or in lunar orbit or any place else, then smaller rockets can do the same thing for a whole lot less and can make use of reusable so why the hell wouldn't he be opposed to this if his workers can keep churning out SLS after SLS, continue to make tons of money, and he continues to get tons of kickbacks? I mean, political corruption doesn't get any more basic than this. But last year, NASA made it very clear that they wanted to work with SpaceX when it comes to orbital refueling or refueling in lunar orbit. So let's say this guy just kind of disappeared off the face of the Earth for the moment. How would we carry this out? Well, first of all, the Starship would need to refuel at least a couple of times in orbit per the normal plan in order to reach the moon. 
and upon reaching the moon, there would be a propellant depot waiting there. Although you could theoretically have one in Earth orbit as well, but the moon is much more attractive because one sixth gravity means that the propellant is six times as easy to get to the propellant depot. As a matter of fact, you wouldn't even necessarily need rockets in order to be able to accomplish this. Before we get to that, I'd like to mention that NASA has recently announced that, as I've always hoped, the Lunar Gateway is going to be the base upon which the first propellant depots are going to be built. As I've been hoping for a long time, this space station without a mission is now going to have an extremely crucial mission in our future in going to Mars, as well as going back and forth from Earth to the Moon. But getting back to getting the fuel to the station without rockets, we could use something called a lunar mass driver, which I've talked about a number of times, essentially using electromagnetic rails to propel cargo or fuel into lunar orbit without the use of rockets. It would require only solar panels and not necessarily a nuclear reactor in order to accomplish this and could be used for a variety of purposes as I've mentioned. A lunar mass driver would be a crucial tool in lunar mining of any kind, whether it be helium-3 or titanium or all sorts of other useful materials that can be mined on the moon. All of these things can be propelled into lunar orbit to be captured by tugs rather than having to use rockets in the future. Very useful device. And Methalox fuels can definitely be manufactured on the moon, and I describe the process in the description, together with liquid hydrogen, which would prove invaluable for future types of propulsion, such as nuclear thermal. As NASA has stated repeatedly now in their developing plans, the moon is the logical first step in getting to Mars. But nevertheless, even if this is accomplishable, how do we manage to build a fuel facility in Martian orbit? I mean, that's a lot more difficult logistically. And besides, where do you get the fuel? And how do you get it to the propellant depot? Well, there's actually a propellant depot in Martian orbit right now, and it has all the necessities required in order to manufacture fuel and to provide it to the Starship, and as you can see, that's Phobos. This happens to be an animation created by Max Fagan, a very talented individual, and this is an illustration in regards to what Phobos would look like from a Martian space elevator. But in short, many scientists believe that Phobos is a captured asteroid, and its composition suggests that it is a C-class asteroid, which is both rich in carbon and water ices, which are perfect for manufacturing methalox fuel and other types of fuel for spacecraft that want to land on Mars. You couldn't ask for a more perfect fuel depot. And since Phobos has such a tiny gravity, it might not be necessary to build a depot at all, just a fuel manufacturing facility, and then small rockets propelled by ion thrusters and guided by robots to connect fuel hoses or something along those lines to the Starship and pump the fuel directly into the Starship's tanks before it makes its descent towards the Martian surface. To me, this seems like a perfect solution. Of course, building fuel depots would be quite an endeavor, but they would serve so many benefits besides just a benefit to SpaceX. And yes, I know Bigelow Airspace is essentially defunct, but the technology behind the ideas that this company was based on still exists, inherited by companies like Sierra Nevada and others. This is the B-330, capable of hauling 300 tons worth of fuel. 
This collapsible modular design, when inflated, becomes as hard as concrete and would be a very good insulator for fuel. And combined with a sun shield, as you've seen in some of the designs I've shown you throughout this video, and an active refrigeration unit, I think this would be a perfect solution for a fuel depot in low Earth orbit as you're seeing here, or perhaps in lunar orbit where it would serve more good. Resurrecting this technology and using it to fuel up the Starship so that SpaceX can more safely make its journey to Mars and to land on Mars, especially with colonists and astronauts, to me seems to be the perfect solution to an otherwise dangerous landing procedure. There are, of course, other solutions out there. But this, so far, is my favorite. And since theoretically four of these could fit inside the Starship's cargo bay, I think that this solution becomes even more obvious, not only to SpaceX, but to anybody who wants to make an interplanetary journey throughout the solar system as man continues its expansion. SpaceX may be the first, but others are definitely going to follow, and fuel depots are the way it's going to happen. So, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. I'm not anti-SpaceX, I'm not anti-Starship, and I'm not anti-Elon Musk's plans. May very well be a way for the Starship suicide dive to work out perfectly, or on the first try even. You know, it could happen. As I say, as I've said before, it's worked in simulations. There's nothing, you know, that the laws of physics states that makes it impossible. But I just see it as being an unwarranted gamble, an unnecessary risk. There are other ways for us to carry this out, and we should really be aggressively exploring them. And I'm pretty certain that they are over at SpaceX, but nevertheless, there doesn't seem to be a lot of indication of that so far. So that's why I like to talk about it. That having been said, this is just one of a number of possible solutions to the Starship suicide dive. There are other ways for us to land on Mars once the Starship has brought us there. And so I talked about a space elevator, which a lot of folks look upon as being impossible, but I don't think so, certainly not on Mars. But this was a lot more doable, I think, a lot more feasible. It's complicated. It's going to involve a lot of logistics. It's going to involve a hell of a lot of work before we actually land on Mars. But in my opinion, it's worth it. Because if we can do this successfully, if we can land on Mars as easily as SN5 lands at Boca Chica, what an accomplishment would that be? How much more doable would the entire process become of building a Martian colony if we knew that starship after starship could land successfully and safely with its passengers intact. That's the objective that I'm sure that SpaceX and Elon Musk wants to work towards, and I think that this is a very feasible way to make that possible on a very aggressive timeline. But once again, I'd be interested to see what you folks have to say in the comments. In the meantime, you folks know how to support this channel. If you want to see this content coming, just go to the description and you'll see a variety of ways to support me. And thank you again for everything that you've already done to make this my career. And I hope to keep growing this channel and being more ambitious in the things that I want to bring to you folks. But until we're making our way on that first trip to Mars and whatever method we use to make that first landing, I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>